Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Friday, the 6th of August, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, and I know I'm going to sound perhaps off base here. But if you go through YouTube, you're going to see a lot of videos where a lot of luminaries, right, esteemed fighters, uh, esteemed boxing lifers, promoters, managers, comment on Manny Pacquiao's upcoming fight against Errol Spence, right? And there's a big question. Can Manny Pacquiao, who's had a lot of fights, who has a lot of experience, more experience than, let's say, more than 90% of the fighters out there. Can Manny Pacquiao handle a southpaw? That's the question being asked, right? In my favorites folder, there is a video where they ask several fighters questions about this upcoming fight against southpaw Errol Spence. And the focus is, can Manny a southpaw himself, handle another southpaw? It's a big question. People are analyzing the fight. Understand, too, as I make this video, Pacquiao is a sizable underdog, right? The betting line's giving him a less than 40% chance of winning the fight. But curiously, and in my opinion, it shows the, we'll call it hysteria of the moment, Curiously, there are hardly any videos online, in my opinion. Certainly not anything close to the level of videos. Talking about whether Anthony Joshua can handle Usyk's left hand. After all, Usyk is a southpaw. Right? Understand, both guys have beaten lefties in the past. Manny Pacquiao destroyed David Diaz. Right, David Diaz has a video online where he talks about how when he was fighting Manny Pacquiao, it seemed like he was fighting an octopus. Pacquiao was so fast. The punches were coming from all angles, and there were many of them. Right? I know. I know. Anthony Joshua beat Charles Martin. No question about it. It's up to you to determine whether David Diaz, who beat Zab Judah, as an amateur, is better or worse than Charles Martin. Whether the angles posed by David Diaz in his big fight against Manny Pacquiao, where Diaz was the champion, right? Whether the level of difficulty Pacquiao faced in that David Diaz fight was greater or less than AJ's fight against Charles Martin when Charles Martin was the champion. Right? It's my thesis, looking at the tone of the comments and stuff like that. It's my thesis that right now we're in an Anthony Joshua bubble. Maybe he catches Usyk. Right? Maybe he does. But the fact that you're getting longer odds on Usyk against Joshua than you are on Manny Pacquiao says a lot, right? Think about it. Errol Spence has never been embarrassed in a fight like Joshua was embarrassed in a multiple knockdown fight by Andy Ruiz. Yet, the odds you're getting for 42-year-old Manny Pacquiao are shorter than the odds you're getting for a younger, unbeaten Usyk against a fighter who, let's face it, has lost before. Well, let's talk about the Pacquiao fight for a moment for the daredevils out there. Right? The people who want extra profits. And let me be blunt. These bets have blown up on me in the past. Right? I've seen opportunities to get extra profits 
with slightly more risk, and that slightly more risk has cost me the entire bet. But I believe firmly that if the Manny Pacquiao Errol Spence fight goes the distance, Pacquiao is going to win the fight. Because I believe the visual favors Pacquiao. Right? As Wilt Chamberlain famously said, and I believe it's true, nobody roots for Goliath. Right? There are times when we see some outfit that looks like the 1927 Yankees, and we say, all right, all right, right, right now in the Olympics, the USA's basketball team, right? People say, all right, yeah, great team, Durant. But you know, deep down, if the bullets started flying, people would root for the underdog. Right? We praise the great fighter who's on top, Mike Tyson in his prime. But when he loses to a Buster Douglas, there's a celebration. You'll even hear blowback. People will start to say, hey, I always knew Tyson wasn't that great. Right? Well, here, understand. Goliath is Errol Spence, the favorite. We're talking about Spence as if he's one of the best in the sport. Maybe he is, pound for pound. Manny Pacquiao, because of his age. Manny Pacquiao, because we've seen Pacquiao in his worst moments, on the canvas, unconscious, counted out, against one man, Juan Marquez. Right, getting outboxed by Floyd Mayweather, right? We view Manny as the underdog. So if this fight goes the distance and the taller, bigger man, Errol Spence, isn't able to knock down Manny Pacquiao, isn't able to badly hurt Manny Pacquiao, where you're watching the fight, Pacquiao's reeling and you say, you know what, I'm giving this round to Spence. If it's not clear, cut. If you're seeing the Pacquiao hand speed advantage, and folks, that's huge in this fight. If you're seeing that one way to beat a great jab, which Spence has, is with head movement, bobbing and weaving. If Manny Pacquiao looks like Joe Fraser did against Ali, let's remember, Fraser's repeatedly slipping Ali's jab. If Pacquiao's getting inside and letting his hands go, I don't see how the fight could go the distance without knockdowns. With two of the three judges giving the fight to Errol Spence. Right, folks? The people are romantics. It's a better story if Manny Pacquiao pulls the upset. I think there are a lot of people, let me raise my hand here, who are a bit surprised too at the lack of respect Pacquiao's gotten. Right, even now, even now, the line's giving Pacquiao less than a 40% chance of beating Errol Spence. I thought the Sean Porter Spence fight was rough and tumble. I thought Kel Brook jumped out to a lead on Errol Spence. I thought we're looking at the Danny Garcia Errol Spence fight and people are coming up with excuses, right? You watch that fight, you say, well, you know, Spence doesn't look 100%. Then the guy next to you says, you know, Spence was in a bad car crash. You know, Spence, Spence is shaking off the rust, right? And you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, this doesn't seem like the kind of fighter who should open at such lopsided odds that at one point people were getting a plus 350 on Manny Pacquiao. Right? If I asked you right now, do you think that Pacquiao has a less than 40% chance of winning the fight? Just understand, the group saying yes is the casino. Right? So... I personally believe if the fight goes the distance, it's a Manny Pacquiao fight. So let's talk about a hedge. Since I believe that Spence's only chance of winning the fight is by stoppage. 
And let's face it, he's a bigger man. And he's fighting a guy who's been knocked out before. Right? The Tori Alba fight. Look back at that fight early in Manny's career. Right? In addition to the Marquez fight. Right? Let's remember, too. The Marquez knockdown, where Marquez stops Pacquiao, is the second time in that fight. Pacquiao hits the canvas. Well, if you, like me, believe that Spence's only chance of winning this fight is by stoppage, and I know that's not how it's priced, this is where you make your profits. In the gap between public opinion, right, the public price, and what the price actually should be. Right now, the under, the over-under number is out of whack. It's high. It's ten and a half rounds. That gives you to the midway point of the 11th round. Would it shock you to know that the under 10 and a half rounds is going off right now at a plus 165? Right, folks? Understand the play I'm suggesting here. Right now, I got Pacquiao at plus 350. So I already am guaranteed a profit in this fight. But at current odds, I believe there's still a profit opportunity. Right? You can get Pacquiao at a plus 160 to win the fight. Right? Plus 160, plus 170, in the comment section of this video, tell us the current odds you're seeing. Understand, you can get, in a fight where Spence is favored, where you're getting less than even money odds, substantially less than even money odds, on Errol Spence, right? Spence right now, the numbers I'm seeing, is a minus 227. You can get a plus 165 on the under. Ten and a half rounds. Now understand how that helps you. If Spence gets to knock out, you can sit there and you can say, I'll be doggone, right? Just like I was when Joshua got the KO over Kubrat Pulev, right? You're watching the fight, you say, man, I'll be doggone. He really looked good. He got the stoppage. But then you'll also know well, I had the under. I get to collect. Right? People can yell at you and say, you were wrong on this fight and stuff like that. You know, I'll be about as wrong as a guy can be when he's in the line to collect after the fight and to profit after the fight. So if Spence gets the stoppage in the first 10 and a half rounds, you get a plus 165. Not a minus 227. No, you get a plus 165. Minus the hedge on the Manny Pacquiao part of the play. But here's what I want people to think about. Right? If Pacquiao gets the stoppage, and this would not be the first fight where Pacquiao is just simply too damn fast for an opponent. If Pacquiao gets the stoppage, and I want people to revisit the Errol Spence who beats Danny Garcia. You really think that Errol Spence is going to beat Manny Pacquiao? If Pacquiao gets the stoppage inside of the first 10 and a half, midway point of the 11th round, round to the fight, you collect the plus 160 on the Pacquiao side of the play, and you collect the plus 165 on the under 10 and a half rounds. In other words, folks, you're just collecting at that point. Let's ask some hard questions too that no one's asking. Why is everyone so convinced? Tell me in the comment section of this video that Errol Spence is better than Keith Thurman. Thurman lost once to Manny Pacquiao. Right? Why, why are we convinced that Errol Spence is better than Keith Thurman? Right? Keith Thurman beat Sean Porter. Keith Thurman beat 
Danny Garcia. Right? Why suddenly is Errol Spence so much better than Keith Thurman, a guy who Pacquiao beat? That Pacquiao is being given a less than 40% chance of winning the fight. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about some other stuff. I know there are some in the sport, Eddie Hearn, perhaps others, we're talking about a Canelo Bivol fight. Right now, I just want to be clear here. I think Bivol wins that fight. I think Canelo would have an easier time against Arthur Perturbiev. The reason is Bivol has movement. Bivol has volume. Bivol wouldn't have to be tethered to the pocket to face Canelo, right? Bivol also has fought more guys at light heavy than Canelo has. So with Mexican Independence Day quickly approaching, and with the Canelo situation, a developing one, right? He was unable to reach a deal with Khaled Plant, at least for now. A lot of other names are being bandied about. People understand that Canelo name would really carry the box office on Mexican Independence Day if we here in the States don't mess it up with COVID mass requirements and the like. What I want people thinking about betting on Canelo against Bivol to consider are the details of the fight. Right first, the weight. Bivol at one point was so desperate to fight Canelo that he said, hey, I'll drop to 168, right? This is in the past. Well, now it's too late to do that. It's August 6th, right? If they announce a Canelo Bivol fight, it's too much, in my opinion, to ask a light heavyweight to drain himself on short notice to fight at 168. What I want people to do, too, is to go back in history and look at Andre Ward against Chad Dawson. Now, I was a big Dawson fan when Dawson was at his proper weight. They had a catch weight for that Andre Ward, Chad Dawson fight. And what you had was a Chad Dawson who looked like he needed a meal. Understand too, I know every fighter thinks, hell, all I have to do is make weight at the weigh-in. Right? After the weigh-in, I'll go have steak and lobster. I'll gain 10 pounds. I'll come in the ring as myself. You know, that's not the way weight works. If you're normally a guy weighing about 175, the weight limited light heavy, let's be real too. Most of these light heavies weigh more than that. So if you're walking around weighing 180, 185, and then you drain yourself to make 168 for the weigh-in, right, folks, you are you can have all the steak and lobster you want. If you don't normally drain yourself to 168 for weigh-ins, you're not going to be yourself on fight night. Also, what people need to do is follow Bivol himself. Right? Has he been in the gym training for a fight? Did he just get out of a fight where he's in fighting shape? Understand. One of the secrets to the Andy Ruiz upset is Andy had just fought Demetrenko. So Andy was in fighting shape. Maybe it didn't look it, but Andy was in fighting shape for that first Anthony Joshua fight. Right? Joshua wasn't able to go forward with Jarrell Miller because of Miller's uh, failed drug test. Um, Andy Ruiz was ready. He was in fighting shape. Now, you need to figure out whether Bivol has been in the gym or whether Bivol, like Roberto Duran, like Ricky Hatton, like countless others, 
has been out at buffets or has been out at cafes drinking wine, having fun, gaining weight, enjoying life. Right, the guy who has been training for a fight, Vitaly Klitschko, training for the Kirk Johnson fight, gets a call, in fact, training for a different fighter, gets a call, Kirk Johnson could not fight Lennox Lewis. Vitaly Klitschko steps in. In my opinion, gives Lewis one of the best fights of Lewis's career. Right? If Bivol's in shape, if he was training for another fight, okay, great. Right? If the fight's at 175, then I could say, okay, well, Bivol's going to be Bivol. But if Bivol hasn't been training, if Bivol's already in Vegas, <laughs> you know, as R. Kelly would say, smoking, drinking, and sitting in VIP, um, he's not going to be ready to fight Canelo on short notice. So what I want people to do, you know, whatever you think of how the fight would play out in the abstract, if the guys had proper training, if the guys were ready for the fight, if the guys were fighting at their natural weights, if they announced Canelo against Bivol, right, read the details. Research where the guys have been. We know Canelo was expecting the fight on Mexican Independence Day against Caleb Plant. We know Canelo fights often. He's a gym rat. He's in the gym. He's sparring with people like Frank Sanchez, the heavyweight. We know Canelo's in shape. The million-dollar question would be whether Bivol is in shape between fights to make the fight a bonanza. Finally, let's talk about political correctness for a moment. I think it needs to be said. If you go to a political convention, let's say the Democratic Party convention in the United States, and it's before a presidential election, and you go up to major politicians, right? Governors of states, um, United States senators, right? Representatives who are known nationally from key parts of the country, right? Some representative from Chicago or LA or Houston or Philly or New York. And you say to them, hey man, who do you think is going to win this upcoming election? I guarantee you almost everyone at that Democratic convention is going to say that the Democratic Party candidate is going to win. <laughs> That's just the way it is. The next Democratic convention, if Joe Biden is running for re-election and you see some governor who's at the convention and you go up to him and you say, Terry McAuliffe, who's going to win the upcoming presidential election, I guarantee you he's going to say, oh, our candidate, Joe Biden. Well, folks, that's the same way that it is in boxing. When you have a big fight coming up and you're asking esteemed fighters who might share the same manager, might share the same trainer, might share the same network, right, outfit, PBC, the zone, might share the same promoters with one of the guys who's fighting, right? I'm guessing that if I go up to a PBC fighter and I say, hey, who's going to win this fight between this PBC fighter and this guy from the zone? I'm guessing the PBC fighter might say, you know, the PBC fighter is going to win. Now, let me say this. I know both Spence and Pacquiao are with PBC. But understand, Errol Spence is trained by Derek James. Excellent trainer. Excellent trainer. So when they track down Jamel Charlo for an interview on this upcoming fight, you need to know that Derek James also trains Jamel Charlo. 
And so, of course, when they asked Jamal Charlo, who's going to win, Spence, his stablemate, or Manny Pacquiao, Jamal Charlo is going to say, oh, I'm going with Errol Spence. What's he going to do? Is he going to diss his own trainer? If we were to go to the wild card gym right now, in Freddie Roach's gym, and ask the guys in Freddie Roach's gym who's going to win the Spence Pacquiao fight. I'm guessing a lot of those guys are going to pick Freddie Roach's fighter, Manny Pacquiao. You know, on one of these films I was watching, they had Devin Haney. And Devin Haney was talking about the fight. And I thought, hey, this is interesting. Then, of course, Devin Haney says, you know, Errol Spence is my boy. And I'm not going to go against my boy. Well, folks, that tilts the interview, doesn't it? So just understand, the world of boxing has certain allegiances. It has certain relationships. You can't overlook those allegiances and relationships in hearing the declarance prediction on the fight. Right, people come up to me and they say, oh, Jamel Charlo is picking Errol Spence in the fight. What am I supposed to think about that? You know, qu quite frankly, this is almost like, you know, hearing that Floyd Mayweather Sr. is picking Floyd Mayweather in a fight. Right, you're going to think to yourself, well, you know, that's family. You know, Floyd Sr. has to think about his relationship with his son with his grandchildren. <laughs> I mean, come on. So, please. You know, before you trust Devin Haney talking about his boy, Errol Spence, and Spence's chances in a fight against Manny Pacquiao, right, before you trust that, what I want you to do is to trust the film. Look at the film. Make up your own mind. I'm not saying to ignore the opinions of guys who might have relationships with the fighters. Right, but just understand, politics plays a role in life. Right, if I go to Manny Pacquiao's promoter right now and I say, who's going to win the fight? That promoter has a financial incentive in having Manny Pacquiao win the fight. Worse yet, that promoter has a financial incentive in keeping Manny happy. Right? Guys on Team Pacquiao are not going to start dissing Manny. Guys on Team Spence are not going to start dissing Spence. Right? So, In My Favorites folder is a good video where they interview a lot of boxing luminaries. Listen to what they have to say, but remember, there's a political component here. Let me also say, too, and I don't say this lightly, sometimes in boxing, even the guy's own handlers don't want a fight to take place, but they understand that to make their fighter happy, they need to let the fight happen. So you have a situation where Canelo at one point wanted to fight Arislandi Lara. His promoter at the time, Oscar De La Hoya, gave an interview where Oscar said, yeah, you know, this isn't the fight I would have picked. But you understand, you're the manager, you have your cash cow fighter with you, your cash cow fighter is telling you, this is the fight I want. Now, I applaud Oscar for being honest. Oscar's even been more honest than that lately. Right? Oscar has talked about Canelo's fight style and the things about Canelo's fight style he doesn't like. Oscar can talk freely about that now because Canelo and him have broken up. Right? Canelo's now a free agent. So now you're hearing the truth. You weren't hearing the hard truth before nor are you hearing it now when fighters like Jamel Charlo, 
who have the same trainer as Errol Spence, are talking about how Pacquiao is not going to pose a problem for Spence that Sean Porter didn't pose. Okay, fine. That sounds like what I call the political party line. That sounds like someone at a Democratic convention or a Republican convention supporting the House candidate. Right from this seat, and look, let me just say this too. I'm just in it to win bets, right? I respect both Spence and Manny Pacquiao, right? I know some people will say, hey, didn't you pick Mikey Garcia over Spence? Hey, I was trying to win a bet, <laughs> right? That's how I saw the fight. Not that I have anything against Errol Spence, right? Didn't I pick Spence over Kell Brook? But just to understand, you need to be an outsider, when you're analyzing these fights, you can't get caught up in prior relationships or political considerations. Who's going to win the fight? In the Spence fight, as in the Usyk fight. I'm taking the guy with the faster hand speed. Let me close by saying this. You know, months ago, we thought the big fight on the horizon was going to be Tyson Fury against Anthony Joshua. That was supposed to be the big fight. That was supposed to answer all the questions. We were supposed to hear that the winner was going to be the undisputed champion of the heavyweight division. Right? Then, of course, a few wrinkles took place. Right? Usyk said, hey, I thought I was the mandatory contender. How come I'm not getting a shot at Anthony Joshua? Then, of course, Deontay Wilder was able to say, hey, I have contractual rights here. How is Tyson Fury fighting anybody else other than me in his next fight? Right? So, of course, the marquee fight, the fight we thought was the marquee fight, Fury, Joshua, falls apart. And instead, we we're supposed to have gotten, by now, Fury Wilder, right? Wilder was ready. Fury got COVID. Okay. So then we have this fight, which was supposed to be plan B, right? Joshua's plan A was Fury. So Joshua, of course, because Fury's unavailable, has to fight the mandatory contender. Now, you've heard the scuttlebutt, right? People are saying, man, you know, this is heavyweight, not cruiserweight uh, will overlook the existence of Evander Holofield, right, who beat Riddick Bowe, right, who was the heavyweight champion, who had been the cruiserweight champion, will overlook the fact that Usyk is bigger physically than Joe Fraser, than Rocky Marciano, than Mike Tyson, right? We're supposed to believe that, oh, okay, times have changed. He's too small today. Right? This fight was supposed to be a foregone conclusion. Then, of course, they start selling tickets. Folks, you don't find out the truth until they start selling tickets. This fight is a sellout. It sold out in 24 hours. The next time you're at the pub, look around. The people around you, many of them, don't see this fight as a blowout. They think this fight might be a historical event. They think the cruiserweight, who's foolish enough to fight Anthony Joshua in the United Kingdom, has a chance of dethroning him. Right? I'm just telling you here online, I read the comments to the videos. They're three groups. First, there's the group who doesn't know who Anthony Joshua is and doesn't know who Usyk is. Right? They're just looking for fun online. Right? It's like, hey, here's a crowd. Let me find out what this crowd's talking about. Okay, fine. Then you have the group that, you know, believes, look, Joshua is what? 6'6"? Six, six? You know, very high KO percentage. He's the man. Didn't Usyk struggle against Derek Chisora? All of these people talking about 
you know, people having a shot against Anthony Joshua are crazy. Joshua's historical. They're just anti-British. Right? You have that group. Right? They always tell me, Dwyer, you picked X against Anthony Joshua. Right? You picked Kubrat Pulev against Anthony Joshua. Right? You know, I think the hedge held in that fight, Joshua by stoppage, but it's okay. I did pick Kubrat Pulev. Right? I think a good jab can bother Joshua. Well, understand there's another group, and you haven't heard enough from them. Because this is the group that's in the pub. They're quiet. They're quiet. But they've looked at Joshua, and they remember Joshua getting knocked down multiple times by Andy Ruiz. They remember Joshua getting knocked down, getting up, looking like he had nothing left against the Vladimir Klitschko who hadn't fought in a year. They remember Joshua, quite frankly, looking like he had lost a few rounds early against Alexander Povetkin. Right? They see Joshua, they understand the defense might not be there. Joshua is the big guy who, if he gets the opportunity to play bully, can bully a guy. But they look at Usyk and they realize, you know, this guy has spent his entire career on the road. This guy is mentally tough. Right? Gassiev, Breedis, right? Joe Joyce. They look at the Joe Joyce film, right? Joe Joyce did not weigh 190 for that fight, folks. Joe Joyce is much bigger than Usyk, much bigger than Usyk. By the way, Usyk, bigger than Sonny Liston, if you go back through history, right? Joe Joyce is much bigger than Usyk. Joe Joyce just didn't have the coordination, the fluidity, the hand speed, the uh, footwork, just didn't have it. So, what we're finding out is the Joshua Usyk fight isn't a plan B fight. Folks, that's an event. That's an event. So let me just say, a few scenarios could play out. One could be that this is the best thing that ever happened to Anthony Joshua. He gets to prove himself against a legitimate threat at a time when there are doubters. Right? He beat Kubrat Pulev. How old was Kubrat Pulev? Joshua's last three fights. By the way, the people focusing on the Kubrat Pulev fight need to understand Pulev makes it into the ninth round. Let's not talk about that fight as if it's Fraser Foreman, as if it's Deontay Wilder Brazil. No, folks, Kubrat Pulev is lingering against Anthony Joshua. To the crowd that thinks Joshua comes out here and beats a cruiserweight in three or four rounds, if Kubrat Pulev could make it to the ninth round, don't you think that this Usyk fight has a distinct possibility of going to the scorecards if Joshua makes it to the scorecards? Right, so just understand, when a fight sells out in 24 hours, it's not because people want to see a blowout. No, there's a group out there that have followed Usyk who know Usyk, who understand this guy, dare I say it, might give not only Joshua a run for the money, but Tyson Fury, who has a problem against smaller guys with fluidity, right? The Steve Cunningham fight. So, a sellout in 24 hours, folks, we might never get Joshua against Tyson Fury. Never. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.